Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Stories from the Sea, Valuing Culture in Irish Small-Scale Fisheries. Uh, my name is Richard Curtin and I'm Senior Economist with Board the Uskiwara, and we are participating in an interreg project called Catfish Man, which stands for Conserving Atlantic Biodiversity Through Innovative Small-Scale Fisheries Management. And we are organizing this webinar as part of this interreg project where uh, a range of uh, institutions, 30 in all from five countries, spanning Ireland, the UK, France, Spain and Portugal are working together to come up with tools and uh, to overcome a lot of the challenges that are facing small scale fisheries uh, across the Atlantic. So uh, the small scale fisheries are affected by a number of issues. And many of these issues are not just local, but they they're, uh, occur similarly across countries. So issues ch uh, challenging the sector uh, include lack of data. And so we are working together to develop tools and methods to assist stakeholders in small scale fisheries to overcome these challenges. So work streams that we're working on include uh, looking at data availability, public data and uh, nationally available data sets, looking at methodologies to assess the impact of fishing gears on marine habitats. We're looking at new methodologies to uh, adequately uh, assess the economic contribution of small scale fisheries across the Atlantic. And uh, the focus of today's webinar is cultural heritage. So this work stream, we're, we're looking at the cultural heritage associated with small scale fishing. and. Um, Work carried out in this line, we have been collating examples of cultural heritage associated with small scale fishing. And we've been classifying them according to the UNESCO uh, cultural heritage classification system. And we will be uploading all these examples that we've collated across the five participating countries. And we'll be uploading them onto a tool, which is a geographical information system tool, which is basically an interactive map of the Atlantic where stakeholders of small scale fisheries will be able to go in and access and look at all the, the data and the tools that we have been working on through the project on this uh, interactive map. So you'll be able to look at the volume and value of landings of the sector, the carbon footprint, the impact of gears on habitats, and uh, the range of the uh, cultural heritage examples associated with fishing will be available and accessible through this tool. So this will be available on the capfishman.net website uh, in the coming months. So uh, today uh, we have got four very interesting speakers. Uh, Mon Khan McGann is a writer and documentary maker. Mary McGillicuddy is a local historian. John Roney is a professor of history. And Shawnee Johnson is a third generation fisherman. So uh, before we begin uh, these uh, talks, the CEO of BIM, uh, Mr. Jim O'Toole, would like to welcome you all. Hello, Jim. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's event. Uh, as you are aware from Richard's introduction, this event stems from a wider project that BIM is taking part in that has 30 different project owners taking part right across Europe over a five-year time frame. These collaborative European-wide efforts help us to better understand sustainability in its socio-cultural and environmental meaning, and not just in its economic meaning, to ensure that we're able to protect our coastal communities for future generations. During the last year and a half, when all our movements were restricted and many of us found ourselves confined to the indoors, our longing and appreciation for the outdoors has grown. And as restrictions have eased, this longing for the outdoors has resulted in our parks and open spaces being packed and our mountains and beaches becoming go-to destinations on even the coldest and wettest days and uh, I too joined the ranks of the year-round sea swimmers uh, as a result. All of this signals a great appreciation for our sense of place and with that there's a newfound appreciation of our sense of nature and indeed as we'll hear today to our sense of identity and our sense of culture. This is the true understanding of sustainability, encompassing society, the environment, and economics. And it underpins BIM's work today and into the future. We are consciously developing our work to reflect the balance that needs to be struck between these three pillars. However, we need good data to be the foundation 
from which we make decisions. And the better our data, the better our understanding, and hopefully the better our actions. Today, we're very fortunate to have an impressive lineup of panels, panelists that includes, as you've heard from Richard, writers, story, storytellers, and historians. The stories, language, and histories you learn about this afternoon in, in our Stories from the Sea webinar are examples of the kind of data that will strengthen our understanding of the socio-cultural values of small-scale fisheries. This is exactly the kind of important data that will help us to inform the sustainable management of fisheries into the future. I'd now hand you back to Richard to introduce our, our panelists and hope that you enjoy today's debate and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'll just uh, a few things to note before we get on. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and it'll be available on the project website. And uh, if any attendees have any questions throughout, just type them into the Q&A box and we'll try and get these answered in the discussion. And finally, there will be a link in the chat to a survey towards the end of the webinar. And I've been informed that it'll be very short and we'd really appreciate it if all attendees could fill this survey out. So to begin, our first speaker is Mankan Nagan. He is a writer and documentary maker. Uh, he has written books in both Irish and English languages on his travels in Africa, India, and South America. His most recent book, 32 Words for Fields, explores the insights the Irish language offers into the landscape, psyche, and heritage of Ireland. Thank you, Monka, for joining us. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, um, so I want to talk just very briefly for a few minutes about the information and the wisdom that is contained about our coastline uh, within the words, within the words of the Irish language. And this all started for me because I had this question, this sort of question at the back of my mind about why did the Irish uh, along the coastline starve during the famine? You know, it's often, it's a question that's often asked. Those small fisheries that in, turn, that in one way were meant to be so self-sustainable and yet somehow, um, you know, what happened to all this fish, the shellfish and sea vegetables that were there? Why did people starve? And in fact, I realized that that's actually the wrong question to ask. You know, often our colonized minds have been programmed to believe that we were somehow at fault for the, for the famine. And rather than acknowledging the fact that our ancestors had no access to the coast because, well, the ruling classes controlled the ports and fishing licenses, and then years of poverty meant they had to sell off their boats. But what came to me so clearly to show the enormous knowledge, breadth of knowledge that local people had about their coast was through the Irish language. Just the sense I got of how wide, deep and nuanced our far forefathers' understanding of resources along our coastline was um, became immediately clear when I looked at the language. The abundance of words to describe every conceivable element of sea life is just staggering. There's literally dozens of words to describe different types of waves, of winds, of seaweeds, of shellfish, of, of um, fishing conditions and uh, different types of coastline. And the sheer specificity of some of these is just bewildering. A word like bulgadon, which means um, a young coal fish that's about five inches long, or lusog, which is the back of a fish hook that is grabbed to remove the hook um, from a fish's mouth. And it's bewildering to us who are now disassociated from this great storehouse of accumulated wisdom that all of this is here. And I'm so aware that, you know, we're going to be hearing from, from Shawnee McGowan later, who has so much more direct knowledge of the words of the Kirkagreen of the West Kerry Gweltoft. But what I did last year, I embarked on a bit of a journey along the coast of Donegal, of Mayo and Galway, just collecting words, sea words, meeting up with fishermen and folklorists and people along the coastline to find out what words they had, the phrases and terminology that made clear to me just how deep their understanding of coastal ecosystems and sea knowledge was, which after like millennia of accumulating and sharing knowledge within communities has now been passed down through us to us through the language. And in each, in each county, in Donegal, Mayo, and in Galway, in fact, in every isolated prominentry and peninsula, and even the islands within these counties, I was offered an abundance of highly specific words that reveal particular aspects of the marine ecosystem, as well as, as insights into weather patterns, fishing practices, sailing techniques, 
And of course, words that just showed the diverse beauty of the natural world along, along our coastline. Words like crumwoven, which is a long stick with a hook on it that was used to lure crabs out of their underwater rock holes at very low, low tides. Um, crumwoven, now that's not from my Gwelta, and I don't know how exactly how it's pronounced, or Leavador, which I was told in, um, in Donegal, which refers to a man who watched for signs to work out where the herring were, and who would then light pieces of paper and throw them on the water so that the rest of the crew would make a ring around the shoal with, the, with their nets. Or Murla, Murla again was told to me um, by um, up in Donegal. And Murla means the act of chewing up small green crabs and spitting them out into the sea as bait to attract fish to the boat. While um, Bultog, Bultog is a shaft or a ring of light um, that's on the wrong side of the sun and that's regarded as a sign of bad weather approaching. So words like these make clear how attuned our forefathers were to the diversity of, of nourishment and resources that, that existed always along our coastline. In each, in each coastal region, people were pointing out to me the local Buraita or Broiti. Um, and Buraita, again, what I was told by fishermen, was an area of deep ocean where the wrasse tended to gather, the ballon wrasse tended to gather under the kelp. So long before the invention of um, echo sounders to describe where fish were, they were able to know, each fisherman knew where their local bud archer was um, and where the wrasse would be, and they were able to sort of manage these in a rich, in a sustainable way, these rich fishing grounds. And I was told that if a boat was fishing a specific bud archer, others would move to a different one. They knew exactly where the fish were going to be, and those are now encoded in the words, in the language. But I suppose the question is, what should we do with all of this rich trove of words then? Like certainly the insights and the timeless perspectives um, contained in some of them will be useful as we're gonna have to grapple with coastal erosion and with the effects of climate change. And also as we begin to depend more on local species of fish rather than you know, going out to Chile and getting our cod or going out to Southeast Asia or, or, or places in South America. But as a stop, gap measure. What I did last year was I gathered up 250 words of these words. So this was a project I was doing for Galway 2020 for the year, year of culture. And the first thing I did was I recorded the fishermen telling me the words and I put those up all on my website, which is like moncon.com and broke them into like one minute or two minute explanations of the words with a photograph. And then I came out with a book. I found there was a publishing house on the coastline in Ackle Island, Red Fox Press. So I came out with this little book and just gave a word and a picture for each um, for each word. So that word is Mabaguiha, a small rainbow sticking up on the sea. And Oignes and Chladig, Oignes and Chladig I got in North Mayo, which is which um, Pat Murphy described, Podic Esso Murrah described as the sense of loneliness on the shore, a haunting presence of the people who lived there long ago. I also made about 19 little short films of these words. And then I've also now made nine TG Cahar little films where I went back to the fishermen and got them to explain more words for me, um, to me. And so, I don't know, it, like I'm so aware that these are only token gestures, gestures, and I only scraped at the surface of some of the amazing words and terminology that are there. But ultimately, what happens to this vast and profound inheritance that has been built up and passed down by our forefathers for generations, it's up to us. It's our birthright. And whether we pass it on as a precious heirloom or let it dissipate and die is also up to us. Gurumila Mahagav. Thank you so much, Malkan. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, it's amazing the, the diversity of the language, uh, you know between the counties and, you know, it's a great work that you've carried out. Um, so we'll talk more in the discussion on this. Uh, so the next speaker up is Mary McGill-Cuddy. Uh, Mary has family connections dating back to the 1900s that were involved in the same fishery of uh, South Kerry. Um, Mary noticed that there was uh, little written material available on the topic of same fishery and also noticed a lot of uh, old black and white photos describing uh, that showed fishing activity and particularly showed women processing fish along the quaysides of County Kerry, but also found that there was very little written documentation on the role of women in fishing. And this has led Mary, uh, or led Mary to do a master's on this very topic 
which he did in 2008 in the University of Limerick. Hello, Mary. Thanks Hello. for joining us. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. So um, I'm just thinking, I mean, that was an excellent presentation by um, Mancon and maybe in the future, um, the women who process the fish that I researched, the Irish language terms that they used when they were salting the fish, there might be a few people who could remember a few words as well, um, which would be interesting. So that could build on my focus and uh, my topic. Um, so I got interested uh, because growing up, I used to hear about same fishing, but if you weren't from West Cork or South Kerry and other parts of Ireland, you might not have even heard of a stain boat, know what it was. You'd know what a curragh was, but you wouldn't often hear the same boat. So by through oral transmission, oral history as such, I heard about it because if you go down to South Kerry or West Cork now, there really isn't any visual reminder or images, although I realize now there are. There is a small walkway in one area of West Cork that I've heard about, but um, any kind of uh, maritime heritage kind of representation of that era is non-existent to date. So I heard about the same fishing and then I would only have seen just a few black and white images, Lawrence photographs of women um, on the piers in either West, Kerry or South, uh, West Cork or South Kerry. And that photographic document or record is what encouraged, inspired me to say, okay, I'm going to dig into this more and in particular, the role of women. So, I mean, if you looked even in terms of the photography that was taken at around the 1800s, women were featured. It was, it, was, it was kind of interesting for postcards. They took a lot of outdoor pictures. So these women happened to be an interesting topic um, in that context. But, uh, and luckily so. So anyway, um, I started researching, but you know there was very little written at the time and still is. And um, there were some records in the congested districts board uh, records and other, other newspapers and other sources. And as it turned out, um, thousands of women were involved. And the period I studied was 1800s to 1930s. There was a boom at that period with seine boats fishing. That's seine boats are wooden boats where you fit 12 men in one, you row boats and you'd fit five, maybe five in the other. So you'd have a crew of about 12. And they were fishing in West Cork, South Kerry. They had been introduced during the colonial period and Cornish fishermen had been doing it in Cornwall and that, that skill was kind of introduced as an innovation at the time. Um, so the mackerel fishing uh, had a resurgence in the 1800s. Prior to that, there were pilchards or sardines going back to the 1600s. And there were thousands of women involved apparently processing pilchards in Bantry and other places. And then that died off. And then in the 1880s, uh, there was a resurgence and there was a link to, there was, there were kind of tariffs and there were, there was a diminishment of fish available in the States. So the, the American buyers came to try and find another source. And so the fishing boomed and it was easy enough to process. You didn't have to have a lot of, you know, equipment in those days. So there would be sheds erected as such, and um, they'd need salt, they'd need barrels so that they'd have ancillary, um, you know, kind of, employment for people making the barrels or creating the salt or transporting the product um, by cart, by horse, by boat, by train, etc. And it would be shipped to either London or um, America for the most part. And the women would be used to basically process the fish. As you can see in the photo behind me there, that's Port McGee in Southwest Kerry. And um, they, one haul of fish would be thousands of fish. So um, that export trade was seen to be a way of increasing income for people along the coast at the time. The congested districts board, which functioned um, during the period, you could see that as kind of like a development agency for overseas aid in underdeveloping countries today. It was like one of the first development agencies trying to increase um, 
conditions for the poor in the poorer sections of Ireland. They tried to support the fishing and they tried to support the women, which they did to a certain degree. And they, they, they built piers as well to help the fishing. Um, so I'm looking at things from a very micro, uh, micro perspective, whereas the next speaker, John, can elaborate on this and speak on a more macro level. Um, but essentially, the women, you could look into why were they overlooked historically? Why were they overlooked um, even in my family when the description was the men, the men, the men, when they were doing the fishing and, you know, I didn't hear anything about the women. So there are various cultural explanations for that. And perhaps that continues to this day that there's often a blind spot. We all have the blind spot. And like they say, ask Welga, you know, Sulela. <laughs> You have to look from the other eye and maybe also have a gender awareness perspective. So whenever you're researching anything, you're also including, you know, how, how did the other half live? What way did they function? How were they included or excluded in society? And you're looking at it. Um, one historian, Maria Luddy, who was saying, reclaiming the past of Irish women and integrating that work into Irish history is a significant challenge that historians face. Um, so even the small area and the small in, in incident at a small period in time is an example. It's an entry point into looking at things um, more holistically and more um, in a more broad scale. Um, I'm not sure how much more time is left. Richard, will I continue further? You can continue for a minute, yeah. Another minute? Okay. So in terms of the women's specific work, they were um, handling thousands of fish per, per load per catch and they'd have outdoor work it was cold it was mucky it was long hours the fish might be the fishing might go on at night and then it comes in in the morning the men were exhausted the women would take on the role and sometimes children would take on the role of processing gutting there were two, a team of two usually there was um someone else to pack the fish in a certain way in the barrels and um, the hours were long uh, but the income you know was a supplement and I just looked at the role they played and how that may have influenced whether it enabled them to go on to various other aspects and some used it for a dowry some used it for you know money for the family some used it for immigration there were various aspects to how their access to work um, enabled them to be part of the cash economy, which was coming on stream at that stage in that period. Um, so the dignity of what they did is undeniable, but you know, it, it was seasonal. So I, it's really been under the radar in terms of historical mention. And I just thought it was valuable. I would um, consider uh, that if you go down these days to any of the keys and, and, and it has been written in various books for people who remember the period they, they see what the, the historically they know of and they can remember but to, to the person nowadays there's no trace there's no visibility of the teeming life uh, as well as the teeming uh, fish stuff that was there in times gone by thank you very much mary uh that was well done for filling this this hole, you know, this gap in the knowledge on the role of women in, in, in the fishing sector historically. Uh, we'll talk a bit more in the discussion on this. Uh, so the next speaker is Professor John B. Roney, who is a professor of history in the Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, and he's co-director of the Dingle Campus of the University. Uh, he carries out research on cultural and intellectual topics in Irish history and has uh, an interest in environmental history and he specializes on the cultural heritage of coastal communities in the west coast of Ireland. So thanks for joining us John from and good morning uh, from America. Very good, thank you. Uh, you're hoping more Americans do come back to Ireland uh, in the near future, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me. as. As we know, historians, um, and as uh, Mary uh, uh, said, uh, try to look at the, uh, the big picture and uh, the value of comparison. So uh, in the limited time that I have, um, I want to look at uh, comparing uh, what was happening in Kerry, especially in the 19th century, um, and the rest of Europe. <clears throat> 
Um, there's certainly different ways to answer this. I'll, I'm gonna suggest an economic answer, a social answer, a cultural answer, um, and also uh, look at a little bit of comparison with Northern European countries. Um, I won't spend much time, but we all know that uh, under British rule, uh, there was very little financial support. Um, many of the Western villages um, uh, and harbors uh, had very few piers that were uh, quite large uh, for any sort of boat. Um, in general, in Europe, there was a lack of the science uh, of fishing and fisheries, um, and that became a big problem at the end of the 19th century when a kind of pseudoscience arose and said there's enough fish that will never run out uh, in the future. So that's a, a big problem in sustainability. But let me um, really get to the, um, the social answer, as it were. Um, uh, as Mankin uh, talked about, a lot, of the, a, a lot of the knowledge, and we can use the word local knowledge, um, of fishing um, is uh, connected with stories. Uh, there weren't uh, textbooks. Of course, there weren't textbooks about a lot of things from farming on, uh, but the stories would carry that. And uh, I would say as a, a non-Irish citizen, uh, certainly Ireland um, is very high in that uh, importance of both a story and of course, even song that carries story uh, about uh, the history and so forth. So a lot of the, the stories of that um, uh, were there, uh, certainly, um, in the 19th century uh, and before that. Um, but uh, looking a little more closely at my work in Dingle um, and uh, comparing the West Coast, there tended to be two types of uh, fishermen or inshore fishermen. Uh, that is to say, um, there were quite a few who more or less devoted their life to uh, fishing. Uh, I know in um, in Dingle alone in 1837, uh, there were about 100 boats with, believe it or not, 600 fishermen um, and another 400 persons who were employed in uh, curing and transporting fish. Um, for a small village, um, even today, I, I suppose about 2,000 people, um, it's a huge uh, number. Um, but uh, in 1851, uh, we're down to about 400 people who were solely dependent on fishing. If we look at all of Ireland, uh, in 1845, uh, there were almost 20,000 vessels and almost 100,000 uh, men working in fishing. By 1868, uh, we're down to 9,000 vessels and only about 40,000 men um, in fishing. No doubt uh, we're talking post-famine uh, many uh, uh, who, uh, on the West Coast, of course, uh, high death rates and high uh, emigration rates as well, uh, typically of that. Uh, the second type of fishermen, though, that's very interesting, what they call farmer fishermen. And we know a lot of the poor could not find subsistence either uh, through growing crops or uh, through fishing. Of course, we know uh, boats were very small carrots, um, and uh, the sea uh, was wild, um, and of course, uh, lack of uh, technique, and also uh, lack of um, of uh, uh, material. And as uh, we find out, uh, post famine, of course, a, a lot of that was sold, uh, thinking that uh, like many other smaller famines um, and epidemics coming, uh, you could sell and then buy back later. Uh, and of course, after uh, the, uh, on Grow to More, uh, that was not possible anymore. Uh, so uh, the same, same uh, question I get all the time uh, that um, a lot of these uh, uh, Irish villages are right on the ocean, why don't they just eat fish? Um, but to really get to the uh, European comparison now too, um, I'm always struck from having lived on the continent of Europe uh, for a while, that uh, as I go around Ireland, apart from the one museum in Dunleary, 
uh, to uh, merchant uh, merchant uh, travel on the sea, uh, there's not one uh, museum devoted to fishing. Uh, whereas if you go to South Holland and Zeeland, every village has a little uh, village uh, uh, village museum to fishing. And that uh, that really speaks to uh, what a lot of our speakers have said that um, the Irish uh, have never thought that uh, part of their cultural heritage uh, is in fishing. Um, we we know that that wasn't their choice necessarily. Um, while fishing, uh, and we know that cod uh, and other mackerel were the staple protein uh, for Europeans. Uh, until the 19th century, um, it's certainly uh, in the in case of Ireland, um, the, bringing the potato in, uh, the poor were really limited to um, what they could get from the land uh, without being able to go to the sea. Uh, and so we see uh, that uh, certainly uh, the Irish diet, not it's not one of the first things to say that they're fish eaters the way you would if you were Portuguese. Um, or other uh, cultures uh, in Scandinavia. Um, and so uh, they turn from that as well. Um, and really, uh, I suppose the point now is that uh, the Irish, there's plenty of literature on the demise of the rural Irish villages uh, and all those uh, problems, although we hope that uh, one positive of COVID would be uh, working remotely now uh, uh, is another possibility of, of moving out of the rural areas as they're doing um, even in uh, New York City uh, has uh, many people have abandoned that for uh, moving to suburbs or rural areas now. But um, certainly if you look at, I've done some work on uh, tourism and we know that when foreign tourists come to Ireland, apart from the joys of Dublin um, Cork or Galway, uh, we'll add Belfast in there. Um, they're really looking for, uh, in the wild Atlantic way, uh, they're looking for fishing villages with rather small fishing boats, not factory ships uh, that might come in. And, and so it's a real uh, question for Ireland in the future about how to preserve the life of communities um, economic efficiency um, is certainly a, a, a great question, but I would say as a, a sort of outsider, maybe slightly insider, um, I think that in the future, uh, there's a lot to be done. Uh, one of the things that I think is beginning to help is the general um, classification now of what's called deep mapping. Um, and it, was, uh, it arose uh, in literature but now um, you can go on the web and uh, Cork has a very uh, advanced uh, website and work that they've been doing down there. There's been some work in Galway. Uh, we are beginning a collaborative work on the Dingle Peninsula with on D-shirt um, in Dingle and many of the local people uh, beginning to uh, use GIS and, and also uh, ancient maps uh, we're probably beginning with holy wells, but uh, we will uh, be really looking at the cultural heritage, trying to capture the stories uh, that are there, um, just to get um, the, the names of town lands um, are amazing. <laughs> but I think that uh, Ireland still has an opportunity um, to um, really uh, collect the stories as we are collecting words but collect the stories uh, and make sure they're recorded. But also I think that they need to be recorded in new uh, ways that attract uh, many people uh, in the public. So different digital uh, platforms um, and ways to do interactive uh, museums. Um, and that sort of thing uh, is one way to uh, recover uh, the uh, stories of incredible cultural heritage that uh, Ireland has. So I think uh, that's probably about the time I have. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. That was great.
Um, so we'll talk more in the discussion on that. Um, I'd just like to remind all attendees that if you've got any questions for any of the speakers so far, please uh, type the questions in the Q&A box and we get to them in the discussion. So and now our final speaker is Seanine McKeown. He's a third generation fisherman uh, who has operated off the west coast of Kerry for 55 years. Uh, Seanine started out fishing in the traditional Kirk in the 60s. Uh, before progressing to own a 40 foot boat in the late 70s. Uh, Seanine has grown up in the fishing and farming community of uh, Bolnagal, Gaeltacht, where he lives with his family. And having been immersed in the Irish language and his local community all his life, he's going to speak on the topics of culture, language, and fishing. How are you, Seanine? Uh, you're on mute there now. Uh, we're, yeah. <laughs> Shawnee will be back with us in a moment. He's just uh, bottom of the screen. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a mute button, button on the bottom left, Shawnee. There Tommy go. Dinesh. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I suppose, over 50 years at this fishing game. I was born on the Dingle Peninsula, on the northern side of it, in a place called Balnagal, a little fishing port where, when I grew up, there was about seven or eight corks, or canoe, naivog as we call them, and two little launches. But going back to my first memories of growing up as a child, uh, sit, seeing my grandfather sitting outside the front door of the house and as we ran as kids, four or five year olds, he'd stop and say, who goes there? And we'd state our name and so on and so forth and he'd ask us, would you ever go and on the far opposite blonde the of have them, would you ever find the wind for me? So we'd run down to the top of the cliff and stand there and let the wind take in the wind and come back and tell him that the wind was coming from the south or from the north or from the east, whichever direction it was coming from. Not realizing that my, with that look on his face, my grandfather was blind. So imagine a blind fisherman to see beside him, he could see nothing. So fast forward 50 years on and going visiting my father over in his house, sitting on a chair. And he asked me exactly the same thing because my father also went blind in his 80s. So it was a kind of a sad scenario for two old fishermen sitting there going blind. But I suppose one of my first memory, one of the memories that I have is the, the Naivoga and watching them leaving on a fine autumn's evening as they headed out to sea. Keown and Yegikina, one after the other, like a convoy heading out to sea. And all they had, I remember them, because I used to get the water for them, a bottle of water inside in a woolen sock and maybe a crust of bread. Now, if a farmer's son was there, he would have a bottle of milk. And they headed out to sea and we waved them goodbye. And Jim Begley, who owned the local pub, came down and we helped him light the, the lantern on top of the pier, the navigation lantern, and the fishermen headed out. So they find the pier again when they came in and in the morning all you could hear was horses and carts and horses hooves coming back to the village and it woke us up at whatever unearthly hour they came and you rushed down the pier no electric there was no electricity so everything was gray and the only silver was the mackerel thrown up on the pier there was something beautiful about it and of course what we did then was we got mackerel to bring home for our breakfast, or if my father was fishing, they were already on the table. And some more of us, what we did was, on the way to school, we carried straps of mackerel in our hands. And whoever was first to hit Maria the little village here, because there was two shops there, and drop them into the two shop owners, they'd always say, Buenas tardes on the way home, after school, call in. And we called in in the evening. We always got a present of sweets or ice cream or something on the way home. And of course, we shared among the rest of the kids. But that was the simple life in those days. I missed the, I suppose, the mackerel fishing, the 
Ray Orr, going back at eight, are the golden years of the mackerel. I was too young for that. When there was something like 50 nine boats fishing out of Valley Dale with something like over 200 men and abundance of money. That was after the, during the First World War and after or the Second World War as well. And I remember them, somebody relating a story to me. There was one fisherman who, on every Saturday, a single man, he was mad for dancing and women, and all he did was he had a new suit ordered from the tailor in Dingle every Saturday because he went to sea on a Monday morning in the old suit, or his new suit. So every time he went to, or when he went to Dingle on a Saturday, he collected a new suit. So there was an abundance of money. So I started off then fishing in um, the first little boat I got in Naivo was from a man called Mr. Duplo, who worked for MGM Productions while they were filming Far Away Haven behind. And he was friendly with my father, and he told my father that there was a, a little Nivog available. So we collected that. And the following day, Mr. Duplo arrived in a Range Rover with a trailer with a second one. So we said, no, we had one got already. He said, well, you have two of them now, keep them. So I started fishing in that one at the age of 17, progressed from there, and bought a little punt from Mr. O'Leary Manum from 17 New Street, Killarney. Progressed from there two years afterwards and ordered a boat from a Daniel Gleason down in Castle Cove with the help of BIM, being granted by BIM. And progressed from that. Then 1978 or 9, bought a boat for 75,000, I think, uh, from Old Driscoll Boatyard in BIM, again with the help of BIM. So fishing has been good to me. I've raised five children, uh, none of them emigrated thanks be to god they're all still around when they're living in cork some of them and the rest of them are living around here um in the late 70s we had what we called a golden art with the it was the time of money from 77 i suppose to maybe 1992 where due to queen victoria visiting kerry in 1861 um, Kerry did not have drift net salmon license, only nine in Kerry, whereas the Nigal 350, Carca 280, I think, Galway had something like 80, Mayo had 240, Kerry had neglected. Because the Queen decreed that uh, due to the sport and the fun, her entourage and the kings and or the Queen or her um her own, what do you call the rich people in London when they came visiting Killarney, that there would be a total ban on Dingle Bay for salmon fishing, which is 144 nautical square miles. So that meant that you could only fish salmon from Sibblehead to Kerryhead. So there was only nine licenses allowed. But against all that, we fought salmon wars and we decided we'd head for the salmon. And eventually, because we had numbers, up to 90 boats from all over the coast fish the salmon out here, uh, they had to eventually concede and they issued us licenses in, I think it was nine, whatever year, 94, 95. So that lasted for 10 years until 2006 when a total man came in and took net fishing, which um, meant that we were back again after all the money in the salmon and all the good times, we we're back again. Devastating the lobsters and the salmon stocks, all the pressure came on them. And now I can see it myself because at this stage, I'm semi-retired. I've worked about 60 pots. If somebody asked me, could I get them um, four crab claws or bring in four crabs? I'd only get, I could only get one crab a day. Whereas 40 years ago, I could get 20 boxes of crabs, a, boxes of crabs a day. So the pressure is on, partly was due to the fact that the fishing gear has changed from when I was growing up, we made our own wicker pots made out of tiggy, we called them, uh, sally rods. And now it's a case of the pots are steel pots. They're more efficient to catch, they're soft dye. And also um, the government have sponsored fishermen to buy these boats called fast workers, which means that a pot can be hauled in 30 seconds. Most of them have 80 pots on a string. A lot of these boats are using two and a half, three thousand pots, whereas when I started fishing, you had 25 pots. So uh, it's under massive, massive pressure. Um, lobsters are just about holding their own. Um, 
because of the V notching, but the crabs, I'm afraid that um, I have a funny feeling that the end of the crab fishing is not very far away. So, Shanae, that is my story with regard to the fishing. And I'll be honest with you, it's a smile on that time and all. I love the sea, and the sea loves me so far anyway. I have been safe. I have made a few bob in it. I have raised my kids in it. And I have good stories, lots of good stories about the sea, and very happy memories. Thank you very much, Shani. Uh, you painted a very beautiful picture there. Um, so I'd like to thank all of the four speakers for your very interesting talks. And now uh, we will begin the discussion part of this webinar. Uh, so we'll be reading out questions. And uh, just to begin the questions, uh, Moncon, um, I've got a question for you. Uh, with fewer people speaking the Irish language as a first language, how do you think this has impacted local information and knowledge of the sea? Yeah, so this is an Irish question, but it's clearly an international question too. So we're only beginning to realize now that the native information built up over generations about how people lived sustainably in particular ecosystems is so often encoded in local languages, local languages, minority languages that are dying. And so where we see it so clearly in Irish, you know, it is not confined to Ireland. But when you have words like stupog, which is a, a shallow rocky seabed out beyond where the smaller seaweed grows, where rockfish and lobsters thrive there, um, or a word like ava, which is the hole that a lobster will hide in, that in a low tide is the lobster is available. Again, these are words from Connacht and Ulster. Um, I haven't done this project in Kerry yet, so I don't know where any of them are. Or conic, which was a word told to me in Mayo, which is... Um, a word for a dangerous churning whirlpool between two strong currents. It's particularly in the Mullen Peninsula, the Mullet Peninsula, between the Mullet Peninsula and the mainland, when the water is um, between the low tide and then that 10 minute period before it changes to high tide, they say the drop in the water can drop by up to uh, three meters. And, that, and that's called a, a, tummy, a comic. Suddenly, you don't have control of a boat or particularly a rowing boat or a sailing boat. I mean, now obviously an engine boat, you have a, a lot more control. But these are words that really don't have an English equivalent to them. So the issue is um, if we want to keep these things, and it's not just a cultural or heritage thing, as I explained, it's vital if we want to learn how to how to live sustainably in precious ecosystems that we keep not only the language alive, but the whole mindset that went with it alive. And it seems in the last few years, people are beginning to realize that we were, te we were teaching Irish as a European modern language. And that's the, the last thing, you know, d d focusing on grammar and focusing on, on modern terminology. Whereas what people now desperately want, as was talked about um, in the initial, is connection with landscape, connection with their surroundings, connection with a timelessness. And so if we can reapproach our heritage, our culture, and particularly the language with that, that it is going to feed us, it is going to sustain us, just like people go on the yoga mat now, there might be some chance. At the same time, realistically, the, the sheer wealth of words in the Irish language, whether they can be used when, we, when the government is outlawing all the fishing practices that went with those words. It was only during this project that I realized, of course, if you're not allowed you know, um, fish in the traditional ways, then there's no use for those words, just as if you're not, if it's not pop feasible to farm in the traditional ways, the words die too. So both things need to happen. We need to nourish those traditional ways of, of practicing our life in Ireland in sustainable ways so that the language, the words that will go with them can survive too. Thanks, Wonka. Um, there's a question in uh, for, I think this is for Mary. Um, is there a link between the style of rowing in the same boat rowing in South Kerry, West Cork, which is two oarsmen per oar, and the Vikings who had the same style of rowing that set up landing sites between Limerick and Cork? Good question. And to be honest, I do not have the answer. <laughs> so it would be interesting to look into it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I looked at more the role of the women, and I have gone sailing now and again, but I know nothing about the boats really, so I'm the wrong mm. man um, or woman. <laughs> but yeah. I just wanted to say, I kind of whizzed through the role of the women in terms of that there, there was a, 
there was a boom period. But when that boom period ended, you know, there was a combination of factors, some of it overfishing and some of it technological advances came in where there were boats that were fishing in a different manner. There was freezing going on, there was frozen fish. So the salted fish um, industry that I researched phased out, it, it faded mm. away. It was, you know, part of the moving on of history itself that it, it, it disappeared. Um, so that was replaced in some areas by women working processing fish in other ways, but the, that period just kind of finished at, at well, up until the fifties. Yeah, was, technology, yeah, changed the way. Progress, sort of, mm. maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, I, John, I would, I, I would oh. add there uh, that the width of boats uh, is very important to um, how how one person could row with two two oars versus one. So I know the Viking boats were a bit larger, uh, and it would not have been possible to <laughs> have one person with two oars. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, John, you've done research on, you know, cultural heritage, you know, in many different areas of the West Coast of Ireland and other European nations. Um, have you found common threads linking, you know, this cultural heritage of fishing yeah. across countries? Uh, yeah. Uh, one, one thing I've been very interested in um, is uh, the connection with these farmer fishermen. Um, there's a little known word. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Manka could help us, but um, in, in Norway, uh, when you go up the coast uh, out of the big cities, uh, they have a word, uh, krill. And I, I saw a connection uh, in an article with uh, a similar word uh, near Galway. And these are people who are farmer fishermen. Uh, they take the opportunity when possible uh, when when schools of fish come through to collect them and try to sell them. Um, but what's interesting is uh, they have their own culture as well, uh, centered around uh, these things, I suppose in Scotland, crofters as well. Uh, and so uh, there are some as well um, in uh, Denmark and, and uh, low countries, except that when you go to Denmark and, and the Netherlands, um, it's a lot more densely populated. So isolation that you get in Norway or even the Northwest of uh, Ireland uh, is not as much a factor. So I, I would say that the, the farmer fishermen uh, were a very interesting group that uh, have not been studied uh, to that extent uh, that we can learn a lot about it because as we've all been saying, local knowledge uh, hidden in stories and words um, have been limited to families and communities. Uh, they weren't written down and these stories were not told uh, too far outside of a village. Um, perhaps song sometimes carries uh, a little more uh, national or international uh, connections. So that's another uh, place to uh, uh, gather knowledge of uh, local uh, tradition itself um, in that sense. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, Richard, can I just respond to what John was saying, that mm. connection between Ireland and Scandinavian countries. John Vabajaco Canila, the great fisherman from Letter Mullen, makes the connection between the words that he found are the same in Connemara Gweltacht as in um, is in some parts off the coast of Denmark. He, he talks, or Norway, sorry, he talks about the word shriel, and shriel, he said, was a yes, disreputable yes. name for an unkept woman used by Galway people for about the island and the Connemara women. And then when he was meeting up with people from Bergen, he realized that the people from the city of Bergen used to talk about their islanders. They also called them shriels. Yeah. And they, they surmised, and it's probably a bit of a stretch, but these fishermen would have gone up and met at the Great Banks, fishing in the Great Banks long ago, and might have exchanged words there. And the other great example of the seaweed expert, Prani Ratigan from Sligo, where she was talking about the shawach, the sloke, seaweed. And because she wrote this book, the first person in Britain or Ireland to write a book about the, the massive lore of seaweed, the seaweeds in Ireland, she was invited over to British Columbia and was there for of British Columbia with the Haida Indians. And she was pointing at, they were doing a shore walk and she was saying, this is the sloke, or this is what we call the shawach. And the Haida Indian says, no, you can't, you can't have that because this is what we call the shawach. 
and did the exact same word. Now, whether it was that some Jesuit or Christian missionary in the 18th, 19th century from Ireland had come and brought the word, I don't know, but there are these intriguing similarities mm. between words. So although these are very local and often, as I said, you know, defined or constricted to one particular peninsula, at the same time, because sea people know no limits, you can also have great breadth as well. You can have great specificity and then these international connections. Very interesting. Thanks. Uh, We've got a question for Shawnee. Um, how do you feel the role of fishing has changed over the generations from the time of your granddad to your father's time and to when you've been fishing? It's, I suppose it's more industrial now. It's all technology. I mean, when I was grew up and the old fishermen brought me to sea, it was all landmarks. It was like the Galbraith Castle on top of whatever it was, some other peak there. Um, and it had become more industrial. I, I suppose the biggest problem for the inshore fleet or for the inshore fishermen are that these big pelagic boats were up to 200 foot, long 60 metres or more, are allowed inside the six mile limit to devastate whatever is in there. For example, if there's sprat inside here and the mackerel are feeding on the sprat, if they come in and take the sprat, well, then we'll have no mackerel. The same with the, the, with the pollock and so on and so forth because they're all in, in, interdependent on each other. So, I mean, when my grandfather was fishing and the first trawlers from Dingle arrived here and they were seine netting, that with trawlers that are ring netting, sorry. And they went out and they brought kerosene with them and they brought rocks with them and they pelted the Dingle boats with rocks, even though my grandfather married a Dingle woman after that. But uh, they hunted them out of the harbour because they were totally dependent on fishing in the harbours. So we're probably the same. Um, if we could keep those big pelagic boats at sea, which they were granted for being way out at sea and keep them away from the inlets and the shores, um, I, I think that things would improve again. For example, when we had the salmon here, the numbers now are in the little school that I went to in Maria went up from 45 to 90 again, because 20 families did settle down and they they came back from England and from America and settled down and reared their kids in the locality. So the Irish language flourished as well, because every night, as you know, fishermen are prone to do, they like sitting on high stools, spinning yarns, and pubs were booming, everything was booming. Um, so inshore fishing, when I look around me now, the inshore fishing has kind of flopped. When I look around me now, in the village that I grew up in, there was 20 houses. Now we have 87 houses. The village I'm sitting in here, now Maria, we have over 90 houses, of which 11 of them are occupied. So we are becoming, without the fishing, we're becoming a retirement holiday destination. Um, that's an interesting point because um, a recent survey that BIM have carried out, we surveyed the top 10 fishing ports in Ireland and we looked at the local economy of the hinterlands and the ports uh, to see, you know, to assess the, the, dif the differences in dependency on the seafood sector across these ports. And we found that um, two, uh, like Holt and Dingle in particular, they were, they had important seafood sectors, but you could see that, um, well, it was also the study showed a lot of the ports were mainly commuter towns now. Like people live there, but like they're actually working in a nearby city. So like in Dunmorris, a lot of people work there and they work in Waterford and in Rossaville, they're working in Galway. Um, so it's uh, kind of what you, you were saying there, Shawnee, about, you know, the, the more kind of people move to these places and enjoy the view of small scale fishing rather than being strongly actively fishing. Um, but I guess this is an interesting way of um, posing a question to John uh, about this, like Holt, Holt has got a, and Dingle, they've highly developed the tourism aspect of seafood and the hospitality. It's particularly Holt now it's got, you know, uh, people go there to consume fish and now, you know, it's it's a part of the seafood economy. Um, but the other, you know, the other, many other ports don't take advantage of this opportunity. And do you, do you feel there's a way that other ports can do this to attract more tourism? 
Oh boy, that's a big question um, <laughs> and uh, something to answer. I, I know, uh, you know, it, it's always, um, I find it um, interesting to try to understand the local politics. Um, and I know in Dingle, um, you know, the Kerry Council um, has a lot of uh, control over things rather than localized. Um, it would be a different case um, in other countries and certainly um, in the US uh, where I'm from is that uh, local, local towns and counties uh, that are smaller uh, would have a lot more control over development and so forth. So I, I, I think at the, at the level of uh, Irish counties, there has to be a willingness to um, identify uh, smaller coastal villages um, and develop their harbors to some degree. Uh, it, you know, it can't merely be for tourism. Um, I think tourism should always be a secondary issue. I think it's about local communities saving their own cultural heritage and giving opportunities, uh, as Shoni said, for, for ch uh, children not to emigrate either to a different country or far away from a rural village. Um, it has to be a preservation uh, of that. But again, it has to be um, new and innovative ways to, uh, to uh, satisfy economic uh, necessities with uh, preservation of culture. Uh, so whether uh, using uh, energy more efficiently um, and infrastructure uh, that would allow uh, more fishing. But as Shani says as well, again, I'm an outsider. Uh, the, the rules about um, inshore fishing and the great uh, pelagic uh, fishing ships that I try to read uh, all the literature I can um, is certainly spot on that that's one of the big problems of localized fishing um, is that. And of course, now we're facing Brexit, uh, where uh, the pressure uh, on Irish uh, boats that need some of, especially Scottish waters, uh, will uh, have a, a domino effect, I think. Uh, so preservation has to occur. Thanks, John. Um, there, we've got a question from the audience here, and I think Mary, you might be the most right person to ask. Um, does anyone know what involvement the women of the Clada had in selling or processing fish? I read recently they were considered a matriarchal society. It's from mm -hmm. Mairead Mallon. Thank you, Mairead. Any thoughts, Mary? Yeah, I have vague familiarity with that. I didn't focus on it as such. But yeah. that much I, I, I know of. I don't know if Mankan came across anything in terms of his travels through Galway. I, uh, what I do remember reading about is they, they had a different culture in terms of even the way the, the men, the fishermen came back and they would give fish to the poor. There was a different structure in terms of, you know, uh, the commerce at the time years, years ago and they had their own, you know, they had their own king and they had their own functions. So mm -hmm. I'm not too sure, but what they'd call a gender uh, differentiation of roles and the women taking the selling versus the men doing the catching would make sense if the men were out all night rowing and, and catching the fish, but I don't have any specifics on it. Sorry to say. That's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I've read some of those things, but like Mary, um, I don't think I can say anything substantive, but certainly I've heard too of matriarchal. Um, and in terms of comparison, um, I know that in fishing villages, let's say in the Netherlands, um, women had far more opportunity uh, because uh, men went out to sea for such a long time, especially the herring uh, fisheries that were uh, more developed in larger boats. Um, and women, uh, in terms eventually of law, uh, could actually begin to own property and run businesses and that sort of thing in the absence of men. So uh, certainly uh, that tradition uh, was most likely in some places of the, of Ireland as well. Yeah, and I've seen that that kind of connection that mentioned in terms of um, Scotland as well. Yes, Scotland. Well, yes. In terms of 
um, women's liberation, those women were liberated long before because of the fact that they had to, you know, they had to work, they had to, they were respected, their contribution was valued, and the, the role of the women in the home and that type of, it was a Victorian move for middle class women not to have to work and all that, that was irrelevant in, in working class communities. And just one other thing in terms of um, the Galway women, I did, do remember just visually seeing again a beautiful black and white photograph of a Galway woman with a basket of fish, very flat basket, and on her head, and she was walking carrying it with her head, which you would see in Africa and you would see in South America, but I hadn't seen it as a visual of, of you know life in Ireland in the 1800s, and I found that you know interesting. Um, um, sometimes uh, when I teach a course on this, my students always get a kick out of, I show them pictures of Cornish or Scottish women, uh, and they are carrying their husbands uh, up to uh, a meter of water so that their boots will not get wet uh, as they get into the boat. <laughs> so <laughs> they make them strong. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, we've got another question here. Um, Dick Bates is saying, um, well done. Uh, has anyone looked at the influence of other languages on the coast? Growing up in Kilmore Quay, fishermen spoke of cells, not seals. This is what they are called in Danish. As kids, we call the green crab crabs found near the shore towels. This is the Breton word for crab. Mm. So, Malkan, maybe yeah. I mean, you know, it, there is so many. I remember that another word for crab is there's tarav, taravan and, and saravan. Taravan is a male crab. This is in Donegal and saravan a female or savan. But it, it was um, Cormac um, Gillespie told me that, but he was up in Iceland. He spends a lot of time up in Iceland. And he found that same word. He found a pub with that same word, taravan, meaning a male whale. And so it seems mm. tarav obviously is a bull, you know, so it would make sense that male things would be called mm. tarav. But the fact that the that the Icelandic people had taken our word for a male whale and used it for themselves, like the, the connection is just shoes. I was in Newfoundland and I had been looking at different anchors, you know, and there, there was the there's the um, there was the main anchor and anchor, but there was also the kailach, and you know the kailach was an anchor made of heavy stone, um, heavy pieces of wood, almost an iron wood, tied up with a piece of stone, um, and it was just a natural made anchor. But you're in Newfoundland and they will actually pull out a kailach and they'll call it still a kailach. And we know those links, obviously, between Ireland and, and, and North, Northern North America are so strong. But they still have it because I, I, I don't know does anyone still have a kailach in Ireland. Probably is at the back of some boathouse, basically a homemade anchor. But it's, it's back to what Bob Quinn was saying all those years ago when he looked out at the hooker and the gloitog, the classic Connemara boat, and realised it was the exact same as part of so similar to the Dow. Um, along that sailed along the Nile in Egypt. You know, we are all sea people. We are what did, um, what did uh, Bob Quinn was saying? We are people of the Atlantic shoreline, and so there was such interaction between us. That's one con. Um, we've got another question, well, a suggestion, a question for Shawnee. Um, can you tell us one of those stories from the the sea? Great memories that you referred to. Um. No, one of, one of the, the first men I went fishing to was from this village here. He was called Tom Murphy. He lived in a little thatched cottage, himself and his two brothers. And all I remember, they had two dogs. Um, I went fishing with him when I was 13, commercially fishing with him. And it was a bit bothersome because he spent half the day lighting his bloody pipe and you had to do all the rowing. But anyway, Dahl progressed from there. And when he got... He was a great man to drink a pint and he was never short of a pound because he wouldn't work for farmers during the winter and so on and so forth. So he always had, as my father said, he always had a lach row and two and six in his pocket. Enough for in the old days, five or six pints of water. But as he got older and the little cottage fell down, he moved up to his sister's up in Balibinurach, which is under the foot of Mount Brandon. And some of the local fishermen of his generation, younger than him probably, uh, went to visit him up in the Boer pub one, I think it was a Friday night. And all who had spent 60 years going out in Bogey Nechopan, as we call the Naibog, because that was the only pump you had, it was a, a baler, 
a cup on. And um, the story they told me about bad weather and so on and so forth and being caught out in storms and so on and so forth. But he had a couple of more drinks than what he should have had at the age of 78. And they offered him a lift home. And he said, no, sure, I'm only half a mile up the road, up to Little Boreen. And the following morning news hit us that Tom Murphy never arrived to his sister's house. He had got a bara hishle, as we say in Irish, a bit of a stagger. He fell into a little stream and he drowned in six inches of water. After his 60 years fishing, six inches of water and a couple of rings drowned him. So I shouldn't count as a skelter, one of the, my stories about a very nice gentleman. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, Richard. Um, yes, Mary. I wonder, in terms of stories of the sea, and that, and I think John mentioned it earlier before we came on, and I've come across, you know, the interesting stories, and Shawnee and probably have, in terms of the travel by water that used to take place, South Kerry, West Kerry, Cork, and you know, there were trawlers going, there were the rowboats, there was a lot more easy access to getting places. There used to be, wasn't it from Valencia to Dingle, there was a ferry, wasn't there? Or a, there was a, a boat. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah, there was. So does anyone have any more information on that among ourselves here? Or any contributors? There was, sorry, there was um, no ferry during my time across, but the fishing boats when they were fished mackerel off north of Valencia, uh, the same man, Tom Murphy, uh, Brendan Flaherty, who had uh, a nabby, a 45-foot nabby in Dingle, had a lot of mackerel on Small Christmas 1948, uh, north of Lilith. There was other, no other boat fishing along the coast at that time, so he sold them to a divan man at Dingle, and I think the mackerel made £5 a hundred. Uh, and 100 a hundred of mackerel was 128 mackerel, though. They basically counted them by hand. She lawed um, three to every hand, 40 hands in Italian, Italian, and another lawed. But um, he brought that same gentleman that I referred to drowned down to repair the nets because they had, I think, was 13 or 14,000 mackerel that night on, on small Christmas night. So the nets ran away from the headline and Tom Murphy was brought by trawler down to Valencia to repair the nets, which he did. And, and that evening he headed for the only pub in Valencia at that time was the Royal Hotel. And in the door he went and he told me there was no other customer in the in the pub having a drink. So he asked, may I have a pint of Guinness, ma'am, please? And she said to him, uh, my dear man, we only serve pint bottles. Well, we can't bring them out the, the big barrels, the sahi, there were the big barrels though, they, they couldn't bring them out in the pumps to Valencia Island. So he had a couple of bottles of pint bottles of Guinness. And the next time he told me he was down there was in November, 1963, the same thing. Happened, he was summoned down by Brendan Flaherty across in the trawler to repair nets that had run away from the carps, the headline. And after his day's work, he decided he'd go up again to the Royal Hotel and went in the door and he asked the lady, the same lady was behind the counter, and he said to her, may I have a pint of Guinness, please? And she said to him, what did I tell you the last time you were in here, my dear man? We only serve pint bottles. And what he said in Irish to me is, my gear on Vanny, wasn't she a sharp woman? <laughs> so she's skilled very well. Fifteen years later, she still recognised him. <laughs> Thanks, Shani. Uh, okay, I think um, to wrap up, uh, just like a final word from from each uh, speaker, and um, one action that uh, you think that might protect the you know the cultural heritage of small scale fishing into the future one action that could be could take place um begin with Marka. yeah i mean you know we should be aware again that this is looking at small scale fishing and fishing and what has been lost and not only in terms of community tight-knit communities but obviously so many of the gweltachs you know the strongest gweltachs were all set in fishing areas now that was wiped away the small communities were wiped away. The sustainability of that was wiped away. And it wasn't by the hand of God. It was deliberate government policy 
put into action a lot by Bordia Siwara. So there's this, you know, divide between us now, what we're thinking about. We are realizing that the world is going to have to ultimately change. This idea of maximizing profits, of having big factory ships, of forgetting entirely about cultures, about language, about tradition. Um, you know, the aim to just maximize profits has led us to such a sensitive, tender area that we now not only can't live sustainably on our coastline, not only are losing so much culture, but, um, you know, we risk, we risk everything. And all of this was deliberate policy. So, you know, it's great that we're now focusing on this, but it's also a great tragedy um, at the heart of it. Thanks, Mark. Mary? Sorry. Yeah, building on that, Man Khan, yes, the policies um, were destructive, but when did they start? They go back a long, long way. There was an effort to underdevelop Irish fishing so it wouldn't compete with Scottish and British fishing when we were in a colonial era. I have records of even the Royal Commission on Congestion went around in 1907 to different areas and they had people coming, you know, like you'd go to the county council now and people coming and discussing the issues. And there was one man in 1907 um, seeking support for a Kerry, Cork and West of Ireland's Fishermen's Association. This was 1907. And then we had to get through, you know, this establishment from the British government, establish our own management. And John would probably know more in terms of all the details of how different government departments moved around and shuffled things around and then different agencies had to respond and there was a certain amount of insight and there was a certain amount of mismanagement as you put it John and I know even from a development perspective there were fishing piers that may have been built that they didn't listen to the local knowledge and they weren't exactly appropriate Shawnee would know more about that you know the 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 the, the bureaucratic complications have gone on for generations and it's in terms of trying to improve things for fishermen for fishing for fishing communities to hold on to our cultural heritage and the social value of what we have and what we used to have um it's a challenge but i think if it could be just prioritized maybe a bit more in each county's county development plan that groups are supported to look at their heritage to value their heritage to in that way, if the heritage is valued and reflected upon in terms of what was, you know, maybe I remember my, my, my father talking about when they would fish for um, crabs and throwing the crabs back, there was no value for them. They were just going to waste, you know. Uh, so now they are a delicacy, but now they are becoming so scarce. And if people remember the history and what was, they might not repeat the mistakes in the future. And they might also value more by, by, as John said, each fishing community, maybe in Holland and Denmark, has has a little museum. If things are done either digitally or in, in an infrastructural way, building on different museums or building on different walking trails or what have you, then people are more conscious and aware of the value of what has been and what could be. And then that will influence them, hopefully, to want to engage in pressuring governments or agencies to have adequate policies for inclusion of women in, in things, as well as for inclusion of coastal communities, inclusion of Irish language, heritage, etc. So that's my perspective. Thanks a minute, Mary. That's great. John? Yes. Um, you know, um, it's interesting that um, if you study the history over quite a period of time, um, it's depressing, uh, but I, I find it very interesting in the year 2020 now, um, and Ireland has felt it uh, coming out of America, the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, it's very interesting the way that, <clears throat> that uh, social and cultural ideas um, can be brought to the forefront um, and minorities and underdeveloped uh, areas um, can be if there's just enough. It's always that tipping balance, isn't it? Uh, in which 
um, people are made aware of something. Uh, most most people uh, have have some sort of racism in them, but um, they're not always conscious of it, and they're not always meaning of it uh, the way they go. So I think in Ireland, uh, certainly all the things that have been said already, um, the government really needs to say from childhood education to um, tourism, literature, uh, to, to so many things, they have to, it, it's not that they're, they're making it up that now Ireland should be, uh, have a fishing part of their culture. It was, <laughs> it was lost. <laughs> and it really needs to be brought back to say, you know, who we really are over a thousand years or more um, are um, a traveling people uh, in the sea, uh, where uh, and they have to embrace that more than merely um, saying that we're we're farmers. Um, and the problem, of course, of the EU quota was it was all based on what was quote historic fishing uh, records, of course, and they were fixed all the way back then. Right, so there has to be a new way of envisioning um, both. Uh, national treasure uh, and also uh, to work it through. Now, of course, you could work the other way. I think the Irish language has benefited from sometimes pressure from the EU to say we're, we, we will decide to protect um, languages that might be uh, have a, a, a fault of, uh, of being lost. So I, I think you have, to, you have to sort of work it, but it has to be it has to be a, a sizable group. Uh, doesn't always have to be very large, uh, but uh, parallels of, of what is going on today, I think is, is positive. Thank you very much, John. And Shawnee? Um, in order to protect our coastal communities, we must seriously stop the industrial fishing that happens within the six or 12 miles. Um, those fish must get a chance. Those fish must get a chance to spawn. The other fish must get a chance to feed on those sprat or those small mackerel or whatever it is. For example, I mean, the small fish have been our suffering because of the total ban on catching mackerel due to the fact that probably the pelagic fellas caught more than the, what they should have had. Mm. So since June, I think, until further notice, I cannot catch any mackerel. And to be honest with you, there's no mackerel there. For the first time since I was born, I've only caught three mackerel in the month of July, which is a sad reflection on something going radically wrong at sea or overfishing by those pelagic boats. So if we, um, if we mind the inshore, where I suppose most of the spawning and the whole lot happens and look after it, well, things can only get better. And on that note, I think we can wrap, wrap things up. Uh, I'd like to thank all four speakers for the brilliant presentations and great discussion. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time out uh, to uh, participate in this webinar. And to all attendees, I'd like to thank you for joining in. Um, for anyone who's interested in keeping up to date with the project Catfish Man, you can contact me, Richard Curtin, at uh, richard.curtin at bim.ie or contact us through the webpage of the project. And um, there's a little survey in the chat box. If you haven't filled it out, please do. It only takes 30 seconds, I think. And um, Thank you all very much again. It was an excellent discussion and really, really interesting stories today.